Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm glad you're joining us on this Memorial Day weekend. As you saw and heard, we have so much to celebrate, and perhaps you're tuning in from vacation. Maybe you're with your family. Maybe you're traveling for the first time in a long time, and you've been able to get out of the house and go visit some family. We're glad you're tuning in to join us from wherever you are. Uh, it's great to be together, even if we can do this virtually online. Uh, you know, I love the Word of God. I'm passionate about it, and, and I know many of you do as well. I hope that you do. I love to read it. I love to study it. I love talking about it, discussing it. I love meditating on it, and of course, I love to preach it. But the reason is not just because the Bible uh, you know, is interesting, which of course it is, or that it's true, which it is, but because in the Word of God, we find the heart and character of, of God himself. It reveals to us what he's like, who he is, what his will is, and that's why we love it. But sometimes, if we're honest, as much as I love to read the Bible and to preach the Bible, there are parts of the Bible that are challenging, that are difficult. Sometimes you read the Bible and it's inspiring and you feel like, oh, this is so good for me. And, and you have no trouble understanding and you feel like God's speaking right to your heart and it's always encouraging. But if we're honest, there are other times when we read the Bible and it's difficult. It, it's confusing. It's offensive even. We don't like it. We don't understand it. Sometimes we would rather skip over certain parts of the Bible if we're honest. And frankly, when we come to this part of our series, Faith That Finishes, in 2 Peter chapter 2, it's a chapter that I think for many of us we might be tempted to skip over, but we shouldn't. And here's why. Though it's challenging, though it's difficult, though it might even mess with our modern sensibilities, it's good for us. As a matter of fact, some of the best things in our life that are good, that are best for us, are hard, are difficult, are challenging. And that's not always a bad thing. And so, 2 Peter chapter 1 is, tells us you have everything you need for life that God's called you to. And then Peter says, remind each other of all that you have in Christ. We'd like it to stop right there, but he doesn't. He goes on to chapter 2, and he challenges us in some ways. And here's what he's talking about. Peter's talking about false teachers and counterfeit Christianity. You might translate this into our terms today. He's talking about fake news and uh, conspiracy theories as it relates to the gospel. What do we do with that? How do we respond to those kinds of things? And it sounds very relevant for us if we're paying attention. So let's read from 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. All right, Peter tells us several very important things in these few verses right up front. The first thing I want you to notice is that Peter says false teachers are common. They, they were there in the Old Testament among the people of God, Israel. There were false prophets. In his context, the first century, in, there were false teachers in the church. And, not surprisingly, there are false teachers in the church today. And maybe you think of this idea of false teachers as like cult leaders, like David Koresh or something like that, or Jim Jones in Jonestown. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about people inside the community of faith, in the church, or in this Christian subculture, who are promoting and teaching a false gospel. Something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, what the Word of God actually says. Jesus himself indicated this would be the case. In Matthew 13, he tells this parable of the wheat and the weeds. He, the wheat meaning the, the righteous people, those who belong to God. The weeds meaning those that are, are deceptive and evil and that are, that are not followers of Jesus. They're going to grow up together, he says. And it's not always easy to tell the difference. But in the end, God's going to sort that out. And the Apostle Paul talks about this frequently in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. He says this, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Here's the point. We should not be surprised if we find counterfeit Christianity and false teachers right alongside the real thing. Peter says it's going to happen. It's happening in his context, and it's happening in our own. Second, he says, false teachers are enticing, meaning they're appealing, they're attractive. It wouldn't be an issue if nobody was listening to these false teachers, if they weren't being deceived, if they weren't being led astray. Why He wouldn't need to mention it. But he does because people are being led astray then and now. In verse 2, he says, many will follow them. In verse 14, he says, they will entice unsteady souls. Meaning people are predisposed to hear what they want to hear, to believe 
partial truths and misconceptions and falsehoods. That's always been true. It's true again today. So let's read on. 2 Peter chapter 4 or 2 verses 4 through 16. And I'm going to warn you, Surgeon General's warning, this part gets a little crazy. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. That's a really important line for us to remember. We'll come back to that, but I want to just point that out now. Let me get that right. God, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly. What a promise for us. And to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant. They don't even know what they're talking about, Peter says will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime, and they are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions. While they feast with you, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice, there it is, entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Okay, I told you that was going to be a bit of a crazy one. Now, it's important, just a few things to notice. First of all, Peter's not saying, hey, watch out, because these people, they mean well, but they're misguided on a few minor points. The overarching point here is, this is serious business. These people are destructive and being destroyed, and they're leading many others to follow them. He's not saying, you know, okay, there's a couple of minor peripheral issues that we disagree about, but their hearts are in the right place. No, not at all. He's talking about people who have twisted the gospel itself, meaning they've taken the message of life and they've turned it into a message of death, destruction. And for this reason, false teachers are destructive. This is the, the third thing I want you to see in this opening section here. They're common, they're enticing, and they're destructive, meaning it's serious business. It, this is something we should, we should take very seriously. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. Listen to how starkly he puts it in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. He says, I am astonished that you are quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there, there is another one. He's saying you're turning to another gospel, but there isn't another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preached, let him be accursed. As we have said before, now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you received, let him be accursed. Could it be more clear? Paul's saying that everything hinges on how you understand the gospel. He says in Romans 1, it's the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. It's, what, it's the message of life. And Peter's, so he's not saying we have some minor differences with these false teachers. He's saying the core of our faith is at stake. Life and death are at stake. Now, I've had many conversations with people over the years who have been checking out our church. They've made an appointment to see me. They've moved into the area. They're changing churches. They've started coming to around. They want to get to know who we are and what we believe. And I've been asked all kinds of questions. I've been asked questions about what we, our ministry programs, our children's ministry programs, our different offerings, our philosophy of ministry, about our church politics, about our view of marriage and divorce, about our view of the end times, all kinds of things. But I can't think of one conversation in over 20 plus years of pastoral ministry where somebody checking out our church sat down and said, tell me your understanding of the gospel. But it's what matters most. It's the most important thing. So I think 
Part of the reason that we struggle with unity in the church in America today is because we don't really understand what it is that's supposed to unify us. We're looking for unity in peripheral things. We're looking for unity in political ideology. Or we're looking for unity in agreement on social agendas. But that's not what the scripture says is meant to unify us. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the message of truth. That's why Peter spends a third of this letter dealing with this issue. Though we would want to skip over it, it we need to pay attention to it. Because it's the same issue we're dealing with today. Jesus will sometimes lead us to alignment on social issues or on our the theological views, but don't confuse that for being united in who he is and what his message of salvation is. They're not the same thing. Okay, so how do we discern then the real from the counterfeit, the, the false from the true? I want to give you a, a way, it's five ways we identify false teachers. How can you identify false teachers? Five, five things, well there's more than five, but five that we'll cover in the text here. Peter gives us five differences or distinctions between false and counterfeit Christians. Number one, it is a different source. A different source. And to understand this, we have to kind of compare chapter 2 and chapter 1. In chapter 1, Peter says this in verse six, chapter 1, verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myth, myths. Let me say that again. Cleverly devised myths. When we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So by contrast, then, false teachers are putting forth cleverly devised myths of their own making. In, in verse 3 of chapter 2, Peter says, false words, false tales. So first of all, it's a different source. In, in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says that these are destructive heresies. In verse 10, these, these false teachers despise authority. False teachers are their own authority. So what's the source, in other words? Second, a different message. I want to spend a little time on this one, a different message. In verse 1 of chapter 2, Peter says, False prophets among those of, the, of God's people, just as there will be false teachers among you, will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. There's a lot there in that one simple sentence. First of all, pay attention to the word secretly. Very rarely, if somebody just walks in the church and starts denying Christ, are people going to follow that person? It's more subtle. It's smuggled in deceptively. But there, if you pay attention, there is a subtle denying of the master. Now think for a minute about who wrote those words. Peter, the apostle, wrote, they are denying the master. What was it Peter did on the night of Jesus' betrayal and crucifixion? Denied him three times. Think about that for just a minute. Peter's saying, he knows the pain. He knows the destruction. He knows what it does to your soul to deny Jesus. And by God's grace, he was restored. And he's saying that false teachers are doing what, I, what he did, denying him. And he knows where that's going to lead. Don't follow them. Take his word for it. Don't follow them. And he says denying the master, meaning all heresies, all false teachings, center around perverting who Jesus is. They change the message. I like to think of this as Jesus plus or Jesus minus. So the, the gospel message is really the cross plus nothing. Let me put it up to you for this way. Really, it's Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. He's, his death and his resurrection is sufficient. It's payment for sin. You need nothing else. And false messages or false, tru false truths often try to add or subtract, meaning Jesus plus political ideology. We talked about that a minute ago. Jesus plus your hard work. God helps those who help themselves, which is not in the Bible. Or Jesus plus comfort and security. Or Jesus plus moral effort, avoiding the bad things. We're adding something to it, and by adding something to it, we destroy it. Or, very often in our context, what I notice more common these days is Jesus minus. Jesus minus forgiving my enemies. Jesus minus self-sacrificing generosity. Jesus, you know, let's take away the idea of sexual purity. Jesus minus, you know, the cross, quite frankly. You take the cross away, there is no Christianity. There is no message of salvation. Richard Niebuhr in his book, The Kingdom of God in America, writes this, Americans want a God without wrath that brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. That's no gospel. 
So maybe the way for us to, to evaluate this is to think, what am I tempted to add to the message of Christ? What am I tempted to take away from the message of Christ? Or what are these people that I'm hearing, are they adding anything? Are they subtracting anything? So a different message. Third, a different appeal. There's a different appeal. They were, in verse 18, we read, they entice by the sensual passion, passions of the flesh. They're enticing based on the desires of the people. So a true teacher, an, an authentic, genuine Christian is thinking, what does the word of God say? And how can I communicate it to these people who need to hear it? A false teacher says something different. Says, what, what, what do the people want to hear? What are their desires? What are their passions? And how can I, you know, appeal to that I'm based on that? So, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. The time is coming, he says. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, Well, that time has arrived, friends. It's here, right now. Peter refers, in, in a weird way, to the Old Testament story of Balaam. You heard that in his, uh, when he talked about the time of Balaam and Baor. That's from Numbers chapter 22. Now, it's a long, complicated, kind of crazy story, but the basic point and why Peter references it is this. The Moabite king hires Balaam, the prophet, to curse God's people. Balaam says at first, I can't do it unless God tells me to do it. But then, because of the money, he agrees to do it. And it's a long, twisted story. But Balaam becomes a prophet for profit, in other words. And that's what Peter's referencing here. For personal gain, he's, he's willing to twist the truth. Now, I know that's an Old Testament obscure reference, but that's relevant today, isn't it? Look around at people twisting the truth for personal gain. So a different appeal. Is the appeal, what, the, what does the Word of God say? Or is the appeal, what do people want to hear? Fourth, a different character. A different kind of character. Here's the question. What kind of person is this message producing? Remember back in chapter 1, Peter talks about, make every effort to add to your faith these things. He lists them for us in verses 5 through 9. Virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness and godliness, brotherly affection, love. For if these qualities are yours in increasing measure, it will keep you from being unproductive or unfruitful. For whoever lacks these qualities is nearsighted and blind, and having forgotten that he was cleansed. He's laying it out for us right there. Is this producing in us Christ-like character? Let me put it simply. Is the message focused on Jesus, and is the result, is it producing character of Christ in us? Fifth, a different result. A different result. What's the end? What's coming out of all of this? Verse 8, he says, the ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to destruction or death. What's the result of this? So we could go on, but those five things give us, a, I think, a good framework for understanding the false from the true. There's a different source. There's a very different message. There's a different appeal. There's a different character, and there's a different result. Let's read on. 2 Peter 2, verses 17 through 22. These, these false teachers, are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. Whoa. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Gross. Well, a lot, there's a lot there, a lot of images there. And I told you, this whole chapter is tough. And it's, some of us, it, 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 I bristle, frankly. There's parts of me that doesn't, don't want to hear that. But I want you to hear what Peter's saying. First, he says they're waterless springs. What is a spring without water? Well, years ago, when I was high school pastor here, I took a group of students, we did this every spring, on spring break, some of our student leaders on a backpacking trip to a portion of the Appalachian Trail. 
And what I mean backpacking trip, we carried everything, food, tents, all of it on our backs. We had guides that were leading us. And for us, suburbanites, it was a, it was a tough challenge for a lot of these students, for me included. One particular trip, we had a long, we had like a 12-mile hike that day, which is a long way for us. And it was really rocky, really hilly. And at the, about the halfway point, it was supposed to be a freshwater spring. I say supposed to be, that's part of the story. We, were, we got off the trail, we got lost, we got back on, the kids were complaining, I'm trying to keep a good attitude, but I'm running out of steam, and the guides very clearly up ahead, I could tell that they were, they were muttering to each other, looking at the map, and we finally stopped, and kids sat down, a couple of the girls were crying, I felt like crying, we were dehydrated, we were exhausted, and I walked up and I said, how much further for the, to the spring? And they looked at each other and they didn't say anything, I knew this is not gonna be good. <laughs> they said, it's supposed to be right here. And I looked down, and it's just a dry, like cracked, with a little bit of mud uh, bed of what maybe at one time was a spring, but there was nothing there, nothing to drink at all. And we had miles more to go before we could have water and rest. So to talk about a waterless spring, I mean, looking down at that, I'm like, it was so disappointing. That was the whole goal. Just make it to the afternoon, to the spring. We'll have fresh water. We'll be re-energized to make it the rest of the way. And we had nothing, six more miles, and we had to drink boiled water that evening. So if you didn't know anything about that, it doesn't exactly quench your thirst. Peter's saying, they're promising you something they cannot deliver on. And this, by the way, is a theme throughout God's word. In the Old Testament, prophet Jeremiah puts it this way. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that, cannot, that can hold no water. Two evils, two sins, he says. Number one, they've turned away from the source of living water. Jesus says it this way in John chapter 4, when he meets a woman at the well, he says, the woman says, give me this water so I won't have to keep coming here. He says, I, I am the living water. He says, whoever drinks from what I give him will never thirst again. Indeed, he says, the water that I offer will well up in you to become a spring of water flowing to eternal life. That's the first mistake. They turned away from the source of living water. Second, they've tried to dig or tried to make for themselves springs or cisterns that are broken, that hold no water, like that, like that false promise on our hike. Nothing there. Nothing to quench your eternal thirst. So first, I want to point out from this passage, genuine Christians know where to turn for truth. They know where to look. In Acts 17, Paul and Silas um, are on a journey to a city called Berea, and they're preaching to Jews in the synagogue. And these Jews hear the message of Jesus, and they're moved that he's the Messiah, that he's the fulfillment of all these prophecies. But they don't just accept the truth. They go home, the Bible says, and they look through the scriptures. They search the scriptures to see for themselves if what they're hearing is true. What a great example for us. Where do you turn to look for truth? How do you evaluate when you hear fake news and conspiracy theories and false promises out in the culture, out in the world, people say, well, Jesus didn't really mean that. And we now have discovered after all these centuries what he really meant, what God was really saying, God's word doesn't mean what for 2,000 years we thought it means. How do you know? Where do you go? You turn to the word of God itself. You ask the spirit to speak to you. You, you do that in community with people that you trust and love. But where do we turn to discern truth? How do we find it? Genuine Christians turn to the source. In verse 19, Peter says that there's this false promise of freedom. Let me read it for you again. Of chapter 2, verse 19. They promised them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. They promised freedom, but they themselves are slaves. Now, with, when we use the word slavery, there's a, we, again, we bristle. There's a lot of evil and, and uh, painful history in our own country. But it's a, the biblical truth here is that there is, we're all slaves to something or to someone, even to ourselves, which is you're the worst kind of master. And this is Memorial Day weekend coming up when we celebrate our f relative freedom, our national freedom. And we remember those who paid the price that we might have the level of freedom we do in this country, made the ultimate sacrifice. And that's a good thing, and we should celebrate that. It's not a perfect country, but we do have more freedom than most countries in the world, and we should be grateful for that. On the other hand, that's just a tiny glimmer of what the Bible is talking to us about ultimate freedom. Ultimate freedom is not what the American ideal says it is. It's not freedom to do what you want, where you want, when you want, how you want, with who you want. Ultimate freedom is found in surrender to another's will, 
a will greater than your own, the loving will, the gracious will of Jesus. There's really only two choices. You're going to be free because you become a slave to Christ, or you're going to be in bondage and a slave to sin or to yourself or to the culture. That's what he's saying. They promise you freedom, but it's a false promise because they are in bondage. They themselves are enslaved to themselves. There's only one who can liberate and set you free. The one who made you, the one who loves you, the one who died for you. That's the, the, the beautiful irony of what the Bible means by freedom. So, second, genuine Christians find certainty in Christ. They know where to turn for truth, and they find certainty in Jesus Christ himself. He's our true north. He's our solid ground. He's your confidence. He's your sure thing. In verse 9, remember we, we underlined this, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly. God knows how to preserve and protect and rescue his own. We find our certainty in him. I think it's tempting to read this whole passage, and there's so much more in here, and want to look out there and point out, yeah, they're counterfeit. Yeah, they're fake. Yeah, they're frauds. Yeah, they're, they're, they're hypocrites. But perhaps we should all begin by turning these criteria inward and say, am I authentic? Am I genuine? Am I really walking in the truth? Maybe that's the best thing, the best application we could make of these texts. I've often heard people say things, and I'm sure you've heard this if you've not said it yourself. I can't believe in Christianity because of all the hypocrites I see that claim to be Christians. I can't believe in the claims of Jesus because those who claim to follow him do such terrible things and say such awful things. And, you know, there's people that are, that are fake, that are phony, that are false, that are counterfeit. And so, therefore, I reject the whole thing. That's a mistake, friends. Skeptics will always be able to point to hypocrisy and inconsistency in the church. They've always done it. They always will. One of the strangest reasons for not following Jesus is to say that it's, I've seen people in the church who are hypocrites. If being a hypocrite li means living beneath the level of your convictions, then who's not a hypocrite? I say I believe in the high ideal of love, but I do and say unloving things. I say that I believe in forgiveness, but I withhold it from people who deserve it, sometimes because I'm resentful. I say I believe in self-sacrifice and service, but I can be the most selfish person. So if that's the definition of hypocrite, I say one thing and I do another, who's not a hypocrite? What should we expect in a, a collection of broken people who are walking in God's grace? That doesn't mean that we don't discern truth from error. It just means that's not a reason to reject the truth. Nor is it a reason for you to say, well, there's counterfeit Christianity, therefore I reject the tr real thing. How foolish is that? Don't reject the truth, the, the, the real, because you have observed the counterfeit. And frankly, this last section here, when Peter talks about as a dog returning to its vomit, or when he says that it'll be better for you if you've never heard those who turn away, I was thinking about this. You know, it's graduation season. Some of you watching are seniors, and you just graduated high school, or you're just about to, and your college or your work life is in front of you, whatever you're headed off to. And we wish you the best. We want great things for your life. It's a time of hope and promise. But what I notice, having been a high school pastor and now lead pastor for many years, I see so many of you walking away to wherever God takes you, whether it's school or your career or a job or traveling, you leave home, you leave the, home, the church of your home, and you're confronted with people who think different things, who believe differently than you, who challenge you, who question you, who even accuse and say, what you, that's not real, that's your parents' faith, that's, that's fake, you need to grow out of that. Now, first of all, challenges, questions, doubts, they're not bad things. In fact, they can be the best things for us if we know where to turn for truth and we find our certainty in Christ. But there's a lot of talk these days about deconstruction, deconstructing our faith, and what it really means is I'm, I, I now see what I didn't see when I was younger. I now see through and I now see that, that how false this was. Here's what C.S. Lewis writes in his book, The Abolition of Man, about what it means really to see through things. He says, you can't go on seeing through things or deconstructing forever. The whole point of seeing through something is to see something through it, something on the other side. To see through all things is the same as not to see. So what I mean is, especially for you seniors, this message is for you. The hardest people to reach are those who think they know. They've grown used to hearing the gospel and cold to it and hardened to it, and they've now begun to deconstruct or see through, and there's really nothing there. I think that's what Peter's saying here. Those who have heard and walked away are in a worse place. So for us, maybe the message is don't turn away. 
don't turn away. Even if you're confronted with doubts and questions and, and challenges, that's maybe a good thing. That may be the path that God leads you deeper into the truth, a stronger faith, a greater faith. Peter spends a lot of time on this issue of counterfeit Christianity and false teachers because it matters, friends. Because it matters. I believe it matters now more than ever in our cultural moment. Not that we're angry and pointing out all the falsehoods out there, but that we're looking inward. Am I walking in the truth? Am I surrendered to you, Jesus? And we graciously but clearly know what the message of the gospel really is. Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again. Nothing else. That's the message of salvation. That's the message of life. Thanks for tuning in. Let's pray. God, we worship you and we thank you that you have given us your truth. And we confess to you, sometimes it's hard for us to hear. We like it, Lord, when you say nice and encouraging and inspiring things to our hearts, but sometimes what's best for us is what's most challenging and difficult. And so, God, we ask that you would help reveal to us places in our lives where we're adding things to your gospel or taking things away, where we're not walking in the truth. Help us to evaluate our own hearts if we are genuine. And then, Lord, give us a spirit of grace and joy and clarity to see the truth in the world, to be able to discern truth from error and to lovingly point that out to those who would follow you as well. We thank you for loving us, Jesus. We thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. We pray these things in your name. Amen.